Stephanie Robles. I'm a senior physics major here at Texas Southern University. And in today's video presentation, I'm happy to go over kind of some cool topics that are found in chapter four. And chapter four goes over the electric fields in matter. Okay, so before we go just kind of dive deep in, I just want to present an outline of the things I'll be talking about and the topics that this lecture video will go over. So specifically, well, we're looking at the first four topics or sections in chapter four. 4.1, 4 we'll be looking at polarization. And then in 4.2, we'll look at the field of a polarized object. More specifically, we're interested in the bound charges because we're gonna see how polarization is actually embedded into finding bound charges and what that even means in the first place. In the next section, when we talk about electric displacement, <clears throat> we're gonna see how all these kind of topics come together and explain what electric displacement even is and how they affect one another. And lastly, we'll be wrapping everything up with some linear dielectrics. More specifically, we'll be looking at electric susceptibility. Now I'm going to minimize my camera because I cannot see my entire screen. Um, and I do wanna annotate the slides. Okay, so polarization. Before I go into defining polarization and kind of explain the diagram, I wanna bring up a rhetorical question essentially. So if we have an electric field and we turn it on, what would happen to a piece of dielectric material as it kind of like enters the field? Now I can't really answer that question without understanding that there's two totally different, well, there's two independent is a more appropriate term of saying scenarios. We have unpolarized material and polarized material, which I think this diagram does a really nice job of um, displaying uh, what happens inside this polarized material and unpolarized material. So on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm not sure if you see my arrow, so I'm just gonna kind of just make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. Where it says unpolarized material, we see the arrangement inside and then we compare it to that of the polarized material. And again, um, they look kind of all over the place. So let's kind of explain what's happening inside. So if the material consists of strictly non-polar molecules, we know that the field will induce a tiny individual dipole moment. Because we know this, our next question might be in what direction and things like that. And if that's what's going through your mind, you're on the right track. Because of the electric field, we can see in the figure how these molecules kind of line up and point in the same field direction, which is very, very important. Because when you look at that of the polarized material, we don't exactly see the same thing. So let's talk about what kind of makes each one unique. So in the case of a polarized, uh, yes, in the case of a polarized material, we know that each permanent molecule will undergo the force of torque. While it's experiencing torque, the molecules will kind of start to line up along, along the field direction. And you can see that happening in the, in the diagram. Um, so if we remember some kind of thermodynamics or some kind of previous physics, we know that we know that these processes are going to occur randomly. And I'd like to state that they will continue to occur unless the elect, until the electric field is cut off. Now, I said that, but I also want to say that there are some outliers to that. There's this term um, that I'd like to call it stuck in the book causes cause calls it frozen, I believe, or freezing or something like that. And it's basically just saying that they're stuck in kind of polarization even after the electric field is turned off. So that's something to keep into consideration um, for just future reference. Now that we're a bit more comfortable, let's go ahead and talk about bound charges. So again, before we deep dive into bound charges and kind of attack these equations that I provided, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce another question. So now I want to disregard what caused polarization. I want to go into what does polarization cause? So what happens? So what? Polarization. So what portion? <clears throat> Before we go into that and start kind of answering questions, we need to talk about the individual dipole. Now, VR, this first equation on top, this is the equation for the individual dipole. And we have one over four pi as well as not. We have some constants. And then we have like this lowercase p r hat um, looking notation that might be intimidating for some. So I'm going to look at this lowercase p. 
And I'm emphasizing that it's lowercase because we know capital P is polarization. So I think that's really important to be aware of. So in order for, go, in order for you to go from the first to the second equation, we need to note that this lowercase p is our dipole moment. And we know that our dipole moment is equal to the polarization. So you see our capital P there times d tau. And d tau, if it's confusing, or if you haven't seen it before, that's just gonna be an element to represent our volume. All right, so next we have this portion that for these two stay uniform, but there's gonna be a substitution that I'll just briefly talk about. So you have your subscript r hat over subscript r squared, and that's gonna stay uniform. It's gonna go, um, just kind of travel straight down. And that's just a fancy form for a vector. And we just need kind of different versions of R to know, to know where we are like referencing location-wise exactly. So we're not getting confused and things like that. So these, these notations here, they stay relatively the same going from the first and second. So we can just plug everything in that we just talked about. And I wanna see kind of like highlight how the other concepts tie in. We, see that we have our dipole moment, but within our dipole moment, we have our polarization and we covered polarization in the first topic. So to go from here, let me clear all my drawings and then close this out, cool. Okay, to go from here to here, it seems impossible, but it's really not. And um, in order to go from this last equation to breaking off into two equations, very important equations, I must say, you need to do some mathematical processes. Um, I'm not going to go over that, them now because that's not the focus of this lecture. But just know that from here, we do some differentiation, we integrate by parts, and then we also incorporate the divergence theorem. That's all found in the book and broken down really nicely. I just don't have time to do that in this lecture video. Um, but I did want to mention it just in case it's confusing, just to be very transparent. So now we have these two equations coming from this, okay? They do come from this, and now we have this. And what do these mean? So these two equations are that of the potential of a surface charge. So that's gonna be um, this side here, where you have your polarization times n hat, n hat's just gonna be our unit factor. And then for our polarization of a surface charge, we have the negative divergence of polarization. So what happens, kind of like, how does this affect bound charges, things like that? Well, it provides an alternate route for solutions. Instead of doing these kind of tedious, intimidating looking integrals, we can work with these more simplified um, versions to get bound charges or to tell us stuff about bound charges. And um, it's important to note that we can use bound charges to calculate the fields that the bound charges produce directly. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm gonna go here. And this is, um, I'm gonna go over a brief example, just in case it's still a little confusing or overwhelming. I took this direct, um, directly from the book and I just thought this was a really clear cut picture of what a bound charge is and like how to calculate it and things like that. So that's what I'm gonna do here. We see that we have this circular, just a piece of tube and we kind of just cut a piece out and just highlighted it here. See, so we have A and D. The D is going to be the kind of like the, I guess, the length of the piece that we cut out. And the A is going to be the cross sectional area, which is going to be like our circle. So when you put um, these two concepts into account, I want to calculate the dipole moment. The dipole moment is just going to be P times capital A D. Well, I just told you what A and D are. A is going to be your cross sectional area, and D is going to be this length of whatever little cross section, well, whatever piece of tube that you cut out. So if you put that in terms of charge, we have that charge is equal to our polarization times A, where A is our area. Um, and I just like to resurface the idea of this and the, like, the biggest takeaways is to understand how, um, how polarized objects, I'm sorry, um, incorporate the use of bound charges and bound charges tell, tell us a lot about the electric fields. And they're kind of like, I think of them as a, like, a, like a shortcut almost um, to really complicated math. Okay, now let's talk about um, 
let's talk about displacement. In the previous two sections, I introduced and tied together polarization and bound charges. We, we were able to determine the field due to polarization of the medium or whatever you're working with. Then that's just the field of its, of its bound charge. So again, um, it could be kind of confusing to wrap your head around, but once we kind of go through everything, hopefully you have a better understanding of what everything is. So we calculate polarization. We have this, this charge due to polarization and things like that. But what about everything else that's due to everything else? So what I mean by that is your charge is due to things like electrons or just other things that are in the medium. Well, we need to account for that. And the way we account for that is with free charge. Now, free charge is denoted by rho F, which you can see here of when you're taking the divergence of D. Um, and D, I'm going to introduce shortly, that's, that's going to be our electric displacement. So to get our total charge, we know that we need to incorporate our charge due to polarization plus the charge, well, our free charge. That together gets total charge. So if we incorporate Gauss's law and then we take the divergence of that, we can get our equations in terms of displacement. And this photo, I think, clear, provides a clear understanding or just a clear, uh, I should say, a visual of what's going on when I mean electric displacement. So you have your positive plate and your negative side, and then you have your, um, um, I'm sorry, the field that it uh, creates. And then you see this capital D. Well, that's gonna be the displacement within the two plates. And that displacement in note is known as the electric displacement. And I went ahead and noted all the three forms that showcase the different forms that electric displacement can be presented in. We have your D equals epsilon naught electric field plus polarization, very familiar. Ooh, sorry. And then you have your divergence of D is equal to free charge. And then you have the one that includes Gauss's law as well, where you have QF enclosed. And QF enclosed should just be noted as a total free charge enclosed in a volume. Now, I'd like to really quick cover electric susceptibility and what that means. So this could get a bit tricky, but I want to, in it's another way of um, in introducing polarization. And that's why I use that same picture because we can tell that polarization is equal to epsilon naught, this XE looking thing and times the electric field. Well, this XE looking thing shouldn't be too intimidating because it's just a constant of poor personality or the electric susceptibility of whatever you're working with. It's a dimensionless value and it's dependent on the microscopic structure of the substance. Um, it can also be dependent on other things such as temperature, but we're not going to really go into that too much. The electric susceptibility, um, think of this kind of like as the amount of electric field applied to a dielectric. And kind of be confusing to note, but just know that this equation here that I provided, if the material that you're working with obeys this equation, we can note that whatever we're working with is um, is going to be a linear dielectric. And I really wanted to highlight that. Um, again, highlight how polarization is embedded into electric susceptibility. Um, and then we have our epsilon law electric field and things like that. I didn't want to go too in depth because I am running out of time, um, unfortunately. Um, so thank you so much for listening. And that's, that's going to be everything. <laughs>